Mm -hmm. As you point out, the cute, fat, chubby baby is not necessarily going to be the Healthy. healthiest or right. even separated from you. Um, from the mom in the NICU because right. we've got to monitor the blood sugars and everything now. That's so exactly right. yeah, there's reasons why your doctors are asked why we screen every pregnant woman Everyone. for gestational diabetes and why we want to get those blood sugars and we want to control them because your body can't handle all the sugar for whatever reasons. Maybe it's genetic. Maybe it's just the hormones of pregnancy. Welcome to our podcast. The better you are, the better you are. Whether it is physically, mentally, or spiritually, when you know better, you can do better. And when you do better, you'll be better. On this podcast, we share knowledge, expertise, opinions, and experiences. All things that can help you to change the game. By the time we're done, it's hard for you not to be encouraged. So join us. Can I, I'd just like to add a point. Sure not as a doctor, but as a patient, right? Um, what's gonna happen is over time, we normalize things. For example, I have two children. The first one was more normal. The second one was uh, the diabetes thing, gestational diabetes. And mom gets bigger, baby gets bigger. But a lot of her friends were saying, yeah, the second one, I, my was bigger too. And I, you know, it's okay. And, and so that, that may lead you to think that that's normal. It's not normal, it's just seen more. And I just wanted to make the point, don't fall into that trap that, well, that, that happens to all of us. Yeah. Right? As you point out, the cute, fat, chubby baby is not necessarily going to be the Healthy. healthiest or right. even separated from you, right. um, from the mom mm -hmm. in the NICU, because right. we've got to monitor the blood sugars and everything now. That's so, exactly right. Yeah, there's reasons why your doctors are asked, why we screen every pregnant woman Everyone. for gestational diabetes and why we want to get those blood sugars and we want to control them because your body can't handle all the sugar for whatever reasons. Maybe it's genetic, maybe it's just the hormones of pregnancy, but that sugar crosses the placenta and your baby can. The other thing that is concerning about gestational diabetes is, and maybe it's, you know, we want typically a little tighter control than when you're not pregnant. And then you deliver and they clamp the cord and the baby was used to getting all that sugar through the mom. Now we clamp the cord, the baby's Insulin and everything's all revved up, going up high like this, but there's no blood sugar coming. It plummets and drops. We can have seizures. We can have other complications. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I think that that speaks to, um, you know, the knowing our risk factors again, you know. And so oftentimes, so in all pregnancies, we, we screen for gestational diabetes. And most of the time, that's in our third trimester when we're after 28 weeks. However, if we have risk factors, we screen earlier for that. So, again, if we are obese, if we are what's called advanced maternal age, which is when we are 35 at the time of age, 35 at the time of delivery, or if we have a history of gestational diabetes or a strong family history of diabetes, all of these things are risk factors. And so it's important to know those things so that we can do the what's called a glucose tolerance test earlier in mm -hmm. pregnancy. And is that fun? No. <laughs> but but all, are all of the complications later on because we don't know fun either? No. And so, and ultimately what that is, you just come in, you drink a sugary drink. Often we wait one hour and we draw your blood. Mm -hmm. And then if that is elevated, then sometimes we do have to do what's called a three hour and um, women just hate doing that. So, and again, you know, just, just knowing when to do it, knowing when to screen for it, it's so much more important to know earlier in pregnancy if we actually do have gestational diabetes or not. And then, I know dentists care about diabetes. Yeah, oh, for sure. <laughs> um, uh, the big reason that we care about diabetes is because if, you're, if you have uncontrolled sugar, all your systems that fight infection go down. And you've heard something, there's, you've heard about gum disease, you heard about ex extracting teeth. If your body isn't gonna heal right or heal well because your sugar is uncontrolled, our results are now unpredictable. And mm -hmm. uh, we, can't, we can't get good results if we don't have a controlled sugar. So we'll see that a lot. I mean, we're gonna talk maybe about periodontal disease and it's a big factor because your system doesn't fight off normal things and, 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 and things go wacky. So it's not really anything different than any of these other doctors and what they're going to 
experience because it's your system. You heard what you eat and, and be better and all that good stuff, right? But if your system isn't working right, none, nothing's going to work well on your body. Mm -hmm. And we certainly know that diabetes is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, gestational diabetes, once it's diagnosed in pregnancy, and that could be any time in pregnancy, but once it's diagnosed in pregnancy is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Why is diabetes a risk factor for, you even mentioned it before, and that two thirds of people, maybe you could say that again one more time so people understand, two thirds of people with diabetes have, yeah, two, is that? Yeah, two thirds of people with, cardio, with peripheral vascular disease have coronary disease. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Cardiovascular disease. And you said something about diabetes putting yes. you at risk for... Yeah, yeah. diabetes definitely puts you at risk because of that lining that I was talking about before in the arteries called the endothelium. Diabetes is very, very toxic to that lining. And so high blood sugars, high insulin levels, those who are type 2 diabetics who are insulin resistant, those, those proteins, those hormones can cause damage to that lining. And when it happens, guess what? You're going to start to build up plaque inflammation and those arteries are gonna contract down, constrict, reduce the amount of blood flow to vital organs. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important to get blood sugars under control. Sometimes I may see a patient who comes to the hospital because they had what we call diabetic ketoacidosis, where their blood sugar is very high and their pHs are very, very low and they have to get a lot of insulin. Well, what happens, I also see that their triglycerides are high. Mm -hmm. That's the fat in the blood. The triglyceride levels cannot be lowered unless you get the diabetes under control. I can put patients on so many medications and still their triglycerides will probably be over 400. Normal's less mm -hmm. than, we like to see it less than 150. Cholesterol, the same way. We like to see that cholesterol lower below 200. The LDL, which is the, which is the bad cholesterol, which carries the cholesterol uh, into the plaque of the, uh, of the, of the uh, artery and makes the plaque build up and causes shrinkage of blood flow to a certain vital organ. That is hard to control. The HDL just lowers. The HDL is called the high uh, density lipid pro uh, uh, protein and that carries all the bad cholesterol out of the bloodstream to get it recycled. That's very low. So you see what we call a syndrome sometime in those people who are kind of a little bit overweight where they have a girth, an abdominal girth, women over 35 inches and men over, over, over 40 called metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'm sure everyone has probably heard about the metabolic syndrome. It's a compilation of risk factors that are associated with cardiovascular disease. And that is the low HDL, low high density lipid protein, because why? You can't get that cholesterol out of your system. Mm -hmm. It stays in the system. High triglycerides. We also see high sugar, obesity, and also hypertension. Three or more of those considered to be metabolic syndrome. And that's a direct cardiovascular risk factor. So diabetes plays a huge role in metabolic syndrome mm -hmm. and also the development of furthering cardiovascular disease. And certainly we know that um, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, increased cholesterol and triglycerides, as you pointed out, uh, unhealthy weights, BMIs greater than 30, are all risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Um, we know that gestational diabetes and preeclampsia or uh, hypertensive diseases of pregnancy are at risk for cardiovascular disease. So those are all risk factors that um, can be associated with cardiovascular disease. And as you pointed out earlier, there's some modifiable ones we want to try and modify. We don't want to add smoking and other things on top of that. That's certainly one thing we can modify. We can try to get to a healthier weight. We can change our diet because food is medicine. We can see our doctors and get under better control early on in pregnancy. We can get into pregnancy, uh, um, uh, pregnancy care early and then know that because we had these complications that we need to see a doctor on a regular basis after um, delivery for the rest of our lives, because sometimes that, that heart disease occurs in the first year, in the first few weeks, but sometimes it might be 10 or 20 years later, and so you're at risk. And then we want to make sure that our dental care um, is good and that we're telling them all about it. And that rolls us into periodontal disease, which is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease as well. But first, what is periodontal disease? Okay. So there's... <clears throat> 
Everybody knows what a cavity is or what we call caries. Periodontal disease is a fancy word that says peri meaning around the teeth, your dental, and then disease. And it's a disease of the structures, whether it's soft tissue or what we call connective tissue or hard tissue, like the bone that holds the tooth into place. And you can have temporary uh, short-term gum disease, like if you got a piece of popcorn stuck in your gum, your gum swells, it's inflamed, you get the, the piece of popcorn out, the gum moves back to normal. Or you have more chronic problems, and that means that the bone that holds the tooth in place starts to shrink away. And the less bone you have, the more ability for that tooth to start to get loose, get mobile, and then eventually, if it doesn't have to be extracted out, it will fall out. And so those are the, the main components of gum disease, meaning it's the things that hold the teeth in place that are compromised. And usually it's mainly either bacterial, it can be through trauma, you can lose a tooth through trauma, or if your immune system is not working right, then you may not have, you may have normal bacteria levels, but now they, they aren't being countered by your, your, your immune system, like a person who might have AIDS. And then that same process occurs and the tooth gets loose, the bone goes away, and you, you, uh, you lose the tooth. So that's the basic concept of gum disease. And Dr. Love Davis, we know that uh, there have been some associations between periodontal disease and preterm labor and preeclampsia. Is there anything you can expound on about that? You know, I don't, I don't think I know. I don't think we know, we know the reason agree, why. Yeah, That's the yeah, truth. Yeah. But because everything is affected, right? So how our dental care, that could be due to how often we go to the doctor. How often do we go to the dentist? Are we smoking? Like, are we someone who, who is just, ha, has immune system compromise, you know, compromise in general? And when we're pregnant, our immune system is compromised. So I don't, I don't think that we know, but because all of those things that can affect our periodontal care can also affect our risk factors for preterm delivery and preterm labor. I'm assuming that those things have got to be related in general. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't know that we exactly know the link, but we know there is a link. And, and I was reading the other day that 54% of pregnant women do not get periodontal care or, or dental care, oral health care during pregnancy. Um, do you have any objection to women seeking oral care or routine visits with the dentist? Or? No, I, th I think that it's so important, you know, and sometimes that's the time we were talking earlier is the time that we actually have insurance. <laughs> yeah. So that might be the perfect mm -hmm. time to actually see our, our, you know, dentist if we have not before. Also in my office, we offer a, a printout because sometimes dentists don't know which medications they can give to pregnant women. If there's a need for antibiotics, which ones, if there's a need for any sort of imaging, what needs to happen. So there's a print off often that your doctors can give you in preparation to go into your dentist that you can literally hand your dentist and say, hey, this is what my doctor says. And I know, Dr. Dungy, that you often, when you see pregnant women, have a practice well, that you follow. Yeah, well, we have the same selfish <laughs> reasons why we want to do that. But um, what we do is as soon as we identify that a, a mother is expecting, we encourage that. Matter of fact, that's not an encouragement. We <laughs> We have them reach out uh, to their, to their care, caregiver, and there's some specific things that we want to know. We want to know, how do you feel about us giving anesthetic? How do you feel about us taking x-rays? If there's an emergency, what kind of treatments can we can, can do and not do? What kind of pain medications and antibiotics can we give or not give? And, you know, if you... If you listen, there's, there's some general rules that people have, but you don't know specifically what each provider wants. Mm -hmm. So we say, why not be prepared? Mm -hmm. Have this in advance. And when the patient comes in, now we have all this information, we can go right to treatment. Oh, they, they, it used to be we want x-rays, we want it shielded. You know, now there's some questions about that. 
and that's fine. But there's, you know, we're using digital x-rays, which is a lot different than the traditional x-rays. Um, and getting this patient, if they come to us, it's a problem. They have a toothache, there's mm -hmm. swelling, there's something going on, and you can't make those diagnoses without getting all the information you need. And once you do, you can get mom out of, out of pain as quickly as you can. And anyone who knows, if you don't have that information and you try and call your doctor, mm -hmm. uh, you're sitting there hours maybe trying to see what you can do or can't do. And I think um, as a dentist, you think, well, I, I know what I think the answers are, but it's still pr prudent to understand that 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 caregiver really is the quarterback here, directing all things. And then we are there to supplement the care. And I love the team concept of it. We communicate together to take the best care of the patient. We all, all know what's going on. It's not blind versus, uh, it, it, I do sometimes get patients that, well, they didn't do anything because I'm pregnant. Do not, do you have any comments on that? Or? <laughs> I, I get upset <laughs> and sometimes I literally have to, you know, sometimes we have to communicate with each other as providers mm -hmm, also. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't happen often, but I'm very comfortable, you know, calling mm -hmm. um, a dentist or a pharmacist mm -hmm. that says something mm -hmm. different and saying, hey, you know, because because there's new research all the time. There's new data all the time. So I, I shouldn't expect everyone to know what I need to know as their OB provider. So sometimes just reaching out, quick conversation, a quick even a fax to their office saying, hey, please do this because this can affect my patient is, is a part of that teamwork that we're all, you know, we all want to take good care of people. And so if we just remember that and communicate that, Amen. that often helps. And I know Dr. Pyle's periodontal disease and cardiovascular risks are certainly um, associated, what would you like to tell us about that? Oh yeah, um, you have to see your dentist at least once a year. I prefer twice a year. I see my dentist twice a year because good healthy gums prevents cardiovascular disease. If you get an infection, a tooth infection, an abscess, that can bloodstream directly to your valves. Yeah. And then you have a really bad complication called endocarditis. These valves, <clears throat> excuse me, these valves can develop really bad infections and abscesses on them, and then they become dysfunctional, and you have to have open heart surgery and replace it. So it's very important to prevent that from happening by seeing your dentist or even your oral surgeon, whoever you have a relationship with, and to make sure you do appropriate dental hygiene, floss, brush your teeth, all those good things. Stay away from a lot of candy it can cause cavities. But your dentist will always tell you all those things for prevention. Thank you for listening in today. Weren't you inspired, encouraged, and uplifted? We hope so because we're praying the best for you. Join us again next time for more betterment. Because the better you are, the better you are. <laughs>